Lecture 1. The dignity and object of this science. All men naturally desire to know. A sign of this is the delight we take in the senses, for apart from their usefulness they are loved for themselves, and most of all the sense that operates through the eyes, for not only that we may act, but even when we intend to do nothing we prefer sight, as we may say, to all the other senses. The reason is that of all the senses this most enables us to know and reveals many differences between things. Animals by nature, then, are worn with sensory power. Now, in some animals, memory arises from the senses, but in others it does not. For this reason, the former are prudent and more capable of being taught than those that are unable to remember. Those that cannot hear sounds are prudent but unable to learn, and the bee and any other similar type of animal there may be. But any that have this sense together with memory are able to learn. Thus other animals live by imagination and memory and share little in experience, whereas the human race lives by art and reasoning. Now in man experience comes from memory, for many memories of the same thing produce the capacity of a single experience, and experience seems to be somewhat like science and art. But in men, science and art come from experience, for experience causes art and inexperience causes luck, as Paulus rightly states. Art comes into being when, from many conceptions acquired by experience, a single universal judgment is formed about similar things. For to judge that this medicine has been beneficial to Callias and Socrates and many other individuals who suffer from this disease is a matter of experience, but to judge that it has been beneficial to all individuals of a particular kind, such as the phlegmatic, the bilious, or the feverish, who suffer from this disease is a matter of art. In practical matters, then, experience seems to differ in no way from art, but we see that men of experience are more proficient than those who have the who have theory without experience. The reason is that experience is a knowledge of singulars, whereas art is a knowledge of universals. But all actions and processes of generation are concerned with singulars. For the physician heals, many, heals man only incidentally, but he heals Socrates or Callias or some individual that can be named to whom the nature of man happens to belong. Therefore, if anyone has theory without experience and knows the universal but not the singulars contained in this, he will very often make mistakes, for it is only the individual man who can be cured. Yet we think that to know and to refute objections belong to art rather than to experience, and we are of the opinion that those who are proficient in art are wiser than men of experience, as it is more to know if one's wisdom pursues all things. Now this is because the former know the cause, whereas the latter do not. For those who have experience know that something is so, but do not know why, whereas the others know the why and the cause. For this reason, too, we think that the architects in each art are more honorable and that they know more and are wiser than the manual laborers because they understand the causes of the things done. Indeed, we think that the latter resemble certain inanimate things which act but do not know what they do, like a fire which burns. Therefore, inanimate things perform each of their actions as a result of a certain natural disposition, whereas manual laborers perform their through, theirs through habit, implying that some men are wiser not in so far as they are practical, but in so far as they themselves have the theories and know the causes. In general, a sign of scientific knowledge is the ability to teach, and for this reason we think that art rather than experience is science. For those who have an art are able to teach, whereas the others are not. Furthermore, we do not hold that any one of the senses is wisdom, since the cognition of singular things belongs especially to the senses. However, these do not tell us why a thing is so. For example, they do not tell us why fire is hot, but only that it is so. It is only fitting, then, that the one who discovered any art whatsoever that went beyond the common perceptions of men should be admired by men, not only because of some usefulness of his discoveries, but as one who is wise and as distinguishing from others, and as more of the arts were discovered, some to supply the necessities of life and others to introduce us to the sciences. Those who discovered the latter were always considered to be wiser than those who discovered the former, because their sciences were not for the sake of utility. 
Hence, after all, such arts had already been developed, those sciences were discovered which are pursued for the sake of neither pleasure nor necessity. This happened first in those places where men had leisure, since the mathematical arts originated in Egypt, for there the priestly class was permitted leisure. The difference between art and science in similar mental states has been stated in the Nicomachean Ethics. Now the reason for undertaking this investigation is that all men think that the science that is called wisdom deals with the primary causes and principles of things. Hence, as we have said before, the man of experience is considered to be wiser than one who has any of the senses. The artist wiser than the man of experience, the architect wiser than the manual laborer, the speculative knowledge wiser than the practical knowledge. It is quite evident then that this that then that wisdom is a science of certain causes and principles. Three reasons people naturally desire to know. Aristotle first sets down an introduction to this science in which he treats of two things. First, he points out with what this science is concerned. Second, he explains what kind of science it is at, that this is not a practical science. In regard to the first, he does two things. First, he shows that the office of this science, which is called wisdom, is to consider the causes of things. Second, he explains with what causes or kinds of causes it is concerned at, but what, but since we are in search. In regard to the first, he professes certain preliminary considerations from which he argues in support of his thesis. Second, he draws a conclusion from these considerations at now the reason for undertaking. In regard to the first, he does two things. First, he makes clear the dignity of scientific knowledge in general. Second, he explains the hierarchy in knowing out animals by nature. Now he establishes the dignity of scientific knowledge from the fact that it is naturally desired as an end by all men. Hence, in regard to this, he does two things. First, he states his intention. Second, he proves it at a sign of this. Accordingly, he first says that the desire to know belongs by nature to all men. Three things can be three reasons can be given for this. The first is that each thing naturally desires its own perfection, hence matter is also said to desire form as any perfect thing desires its imperfection. Therefore, since the intellect by which man is what he is considered in itself is all things potentially and becomes them actually only through knowledge because the intellect is none of the things that exist before it understands them as is stated and on the soul. So each man naturally desires knowledge just as matter desires form. The second reason is that each thing has a natural inclination to perform its proper operation as something hot is naturally inclined to heat and something heavy to be moved downwards. Now the proper operation of man as man is to understand, for by reason of this he differs from all other things. Hence the desire of man is naturally inclined to understand and therefore to possess scientific knowledge. The third reason is that it is desirable for each thing to be united to its source, since it is in this that the perfection of each thing consists. This is also the reason why circular motion is the most perfect motion, as is proved in physics, because its terminus is united to its starting point. Now it is only by means of his intellect that man is united to the separate substances which are the source of the human intellect and to which the human intellect is related as something imperfect to something perfect. It is for this reason, too, that the ultimate happiness of man consists in this union. Therefore, man naturally desires to know. The fact that some men do not devote any study to this science does not disprove this thesis. For those who desire some end are often prevented from pursuing it for some reason or other, either because of the difficulty of attaining it or because of other occupations. And in this way, too, even though all men desire knowledge, still not all devote themselves to the pursuit of it because they are held back by other things such as pleasures or the needs of the present life. Or they may even avoid the effort that learning demands because they are lazy. Now Aristotle makes this statement in order to show that it is not pointless to search for a science that is not useful for anything else such as this science since a natural desire cannot exist in vain. Then he establishes his thesis by means of an example. Since our senses serve us in two respects, in knowing things and in meeting the needs of life, we love them for themselves inasmuch as they enable us to know and also to assist us to live. 
This is evident from the fact that all men take the greatest delight in the sense that it is most knowing, the sense of sight. We value it not merely so we can do things, but even when we are not required to act at all. This is because this sense of sight is the most knowing of all our senses and makes us aware of many differences between things. In this part, it is clear that he gives two reasons why sight is superior to the other senses in knowing. The first is that it knows in a more perfect way, and this belongs to it because it is the most spiritual of all senses. For the more immaterial a power is, the more perfectly it knows, and evidently sight is a more immaterial sense if we consider the modification produced in it by its objects. All other sensible objects change both the organ and medium of a sense by a material modification. For example, the object of touch by heating and cooling, the object of taste by affecting the organ of taste with some flavor through the medium of saliva, the object of hearing by means of motion in the body, and the object of smell by means of the evaporation of vaporous elements. elements. But the object of sight changes the organ and medium of sight only by a spiritual modification. Neither the pupil of the eye nor the air becomes colored, but they only receive the form of color in a spiritual mode of being. Therefore, because actual sensation consists in the actual modification of a sense by its object, it is evident that that sense which is changed in a more immaterial and spiritual way is more spiritual in its operation. Hence, sight judges about sensible objects in a more certain and more per and perfect way than the other senses do. The other reason which he gives for the superiority of sight is that it gives us more information about things. This is attributable to the nature of its object, for touch and taste, and likewise smell and hearing, perceive those accidents by which lower bodies are distinguished from higher ones. But sight perceives those accidents that lower bodies have in common with higher ones, for a thing is actually visible by means of light, which is common on both to lower and higher bodies, as is said, and on the soul. Hence the celestial bodies are perceptible only by means of sight. There is also another reason. Sight informs us by many differences between things. For we seem to know sensible things best by means of sight and touch, but especially by means of sight. The reason for this can be drawn from the fact that the other three senses perceive those accidents that in a way flow from a sensible body and do not remain in it. Thus sound comes from a sensible body and as much as it flows away from it and does not remain in it. The same thing is true of the evaporation of volatile elements with which and by which odor is diffused, but sight and touch perceive those accidents that remain in sensible bodies, such as color, warmth, and coldness, hence the judgment of sight and touch is extended to things themselves, whereas the judgment of hearing and smell is extended to those accidents that flow from things and not to things themselves. It is for this reason that figure and size and the like by which a sensible being itself is disposed are perceived more by sight and touch than by the other senses, and they are perceived more by sight than by touch, both because sight knows more efficaciously, as has been pointed out, and also because quantity and those accidents which naturally follow from it, which are seen to be the common sensibles, are more closely related to the object of sight than to that of touch. This is clear from the fact that the object of sight belongs in some degree to every body having some quantity, whereas the object of touch does not. Animals by nature, then, here he considers the hierarchy in knowledge. For he first does this with respect to brute animals, and then with respect to man, not thus other animals. With respect to brute animals, he mentions first what all animals have in common, second that by which they differ and surpass one another at now in some animals. Now all animals are alike in the respect that they possess by nature the power of sensation, for an animal is an animal by reason of the fact that it has a sentient soul, which is the nature of an animal, in the sense in which the distinctive form of each thing is its nature. But even though all animals are naturally endowed with sensory power, not all animals have all the senses, but only perfect animals. All have the sense of touch, for this sense in a way is the basis of all the other senses. However, not all have the sense of sight, because this sense knows in a more perfect way than all the other senses. 
but touch is more necessary for it perceives the elements of which an animal is composed the hot cold moist and dry hence just as sight knows is a mar in a more perfect way than the other senses in a similar way touch is more necessary inasmuch as it is the first to exist in the process of generation for those things that are more perfect according to this process come later in the development of the individual which is moved from a state of imperfection to one of perfection now in some animals here he indicates the different kinds and three levels of knowing found among brute animals for there are certain animals that have a sensation although they do not have memory which comes from sensation for memory accompanies imagination which is a movement caused by the senses in their act of sensing as we find it on the soul but in some animals imagination does not accompany sensation and therefore memory cannot exist in them this is found verified in imperfect animals which are incapable of local motion such as shellfish since sensory cognition enables animals to make provision for the necessities of life and to perform their characteristic operations those animals that move towards something at a distance by means of locomotion must have memory if the anticipated goal by which they are induced to move did not remain in them through memory they could not continue to move towards the intended goal which they pursue but in the case of immobile animals, the reception of a present sensible quality is sufficient for them to perform their characteristic operations since they do not move toward anything at a distance. Hence, these animals have an indefinite movement as a result of vague imagination alone, as is said and on the soul. Again, from the fact that some animals have memory and some do not, it follows that some are prudent and some are not. For since prudence makes provision for the future for memory of the past, hence Cicero makes memory, understanding, and foresight parts of prudence and rhetoric. Prudence cannot be had by those animals that lack memory. Now those animals that have memory can have some prudence, although prudence has one meaning in the case of brute animals and another in the case of man. Men are prudent inasmuch as they deliber as they deliberate rationally about what they ought to do hence ethics says that prudence is a rationally regulated plan of things to be done but the judgment about things to be done that is not a result of any rational deliberation but of some natural instinct is called prudence in other animals hence in other animals prudence is not prudence is a natural estimate about the pursuit of what is fitting and the avoidance of what is harmful as a lamb follows its mother and runs away from a wolf but among those animals that have memory some have hearing and some do not and all those that cannot hear as the bee or any other such animal are still incapable of being taught even though they have prudence that is they cannot be habituated to the doing or avoiding of something though through someone else's instruction because such instruction is received chiefly by means of hearing hence and on the sense and perception it is stated that hearing is the sense by which we receive instruction furthermore the statement that bees do not have hearing is not opposed in any way to the observation that they are frightened by certain sounds for just as a very loud sound kills an animal and splits wood, as is evident in the case of thunder, not because of the sound, but because of the violent motion of the air in which the sound is present in a similar fashion, those animals that lack hearing can be frightened by the sounding air, even though they have no perception of sound. However, those animals that have both memory and hearing can be prudent and teachable. It is evident, then, that there are three levels of knowing in animals. The first level is that had by animals that have neither hearing nor memory, which are therefore neither capable of being taught nor of being prudent. The second level is that of animals that have memory but are unable to hear, which are therefore prudent but incapable of being taught. The third level is that of animals that have both of these faculties and which are therefore prudent and capable of being taught. Moreover, there cannot be a fourth level so that there would be an animal that had hearing but lacked memory. For those senses that perceive their sensible objects by means of an external medium and hearing is one of these are found only in animals that have locomotion and which cannot do without memory as has been pointed out. Thus other animals, here he explains the levels of human knowing. In regard to this, he does two things. First, he explains how human knowing surpasses the knowing of the above mentioned animals. Second, he shows how human knowing is divided into different levels at now and then. Accordingly, 
In the first part, he says that the life of animals is ruled by imagination and memory, by imagination in the case of imperfect animals, and by memory in the case of perfect animals. For even though the latter also have imagination, still each thing is said to be ruled by that power which holds the highest place within it. Now, in this discussion, life does not mean the being of a living thing as is understood and on the soul when he says that for a living thing it to live is to be for the life of an animal in this sense is not the result of memory or imagination but is prior to both of these but life is taken to mean vital activity just as we are also accustomed to speak of association of the life of men but by the fact that he establishes the truth about the cognition of animals with reference to the management of life, we are given to understand that knowing belongs to these animals not for the sake of knowing, but because of the need for action. Now, as is stated below in men, the next thing above memory is experience, which, anim which some animals have only to a small degree. For an experience arises from the association of many singular intentions received in memory, and this kind of association is proper to man and pertains to the cognitive power, also called particular reason, which, which associates particular intentions just as universal reason associates universal ones. Now, since animals are accustomed to pursue or avoid certain things as a result of many sensations in memory, they seem to share something of experience, even though it be slight. But above experience, which belongs to particular reason, men have as their chief power a universal reason by means of which they live. And just as experience is related to particular reason in men and customary activity to memory in animals, in a similar way art is related to universal reason. Therefore, just as the life of animals is ruled in a perfect way by memory together with activity that has become habitual through training, or in any other way whatsoever, in a similar way man is ruled perfectly by reason, perfected by art. Some men, however, are ruled by reason without art, but this rule is imperfect. Now in men, here he explains the different levels of human knowing, and in regard to this he does two things. First, he compares art with experience. Second, he compares speculative art with practical art at it is only fitting. Here he treats the first point in two ways. First, he explains how art and experience originate. Second, he explains how one is superior to the other at it and at in practical matters. In regard to the first, he does two things. First, he explains how each of the above originates. Second, he makes this clear by means of an example at for to judge. In regard to the first, he does two things. First, he describes how experience originates. Second, and second, how art originates at, but in men, science. He says first, then, that in men, experience is caused by memory. This is the way in which it is caused from several memories of a single thing. A man experience, acquires experience about some matter, and by means of this experience, he is able to act easily and correctly. Therefore, because experience provides us with the ability to act easily and correctly, it seems to be almost the same as science and art, for they are alike in as much as in either case for, from many instances a single view of a thing is obtained. But they differ in as much as universals are grasped by art and singular things are experienced, as is stated later, but in men, science and art. Here he describes the way in which art arises. He says that in men, science and art come from experience. And he proves this on the authority of Polis, who says that experience causes art and inexperience causes luck. For when an inexperienced person acts correctly, this happens by chance. Furthermore, the way in which art arises from experience is the same as the way spoken of above in which experience arises from memory, just as one experiential cognition comes from many memories of a thing, so does one universal judgment about all similar things come from the apprehension of many experiences. Hence, art has this more than does experience, because experience is concerned only with singulars, while art is concerned with universals. Next, he makes this clear by means of examples at for to judge, when a man has learned that this medicine has been beneficial to Socrates and to Plato and to many other individuals who were suffering from some particular disease, whatever it may be, this is a matter of experience. But when a man learns that this particular treatment is beneficial to men who have some particular kind of disease and some particular kind of physical constitution, 
as it has benefited the feverish, the phlegmatic, and the bilious, it is now a matter of art. In practical matters, he compares art to experience from the viewpoint of preeminence, and in regard to this, he does two things. First, he compares them from the viewpoint of action, second, from the viewpoint of knowledge, at yet we think. He says then that in practical matters, experience seems to differ in no way from art when it comes to acting, the difference between experience and art, which is difference between the universal and the singular, disappears. Because art operates with reference to singulars just as experience does, therefore the aforesaid difference appertains only to the way in which they come to know, but even though art and experience do not differ in the way in which they act, because both act on singular things, nevertheless they differ in the effectiveness of their action, for men of experience act more effectively than those who have the universal knowledge of an art, but lack experience. This is because actions have to do with singular things, and this all and all processes of generation belong to singular things for universals are neither generated nor moved except accidentally and as much as this belongs to singular things for man is generated when this man is generated hence a physician heals man only accidentally but properly he heals plato or socrates or some man that can be individually named to whom the nature of man belongs or rather to whom it is accidental and as much as he is the one healed for even though the nature of man belongs to Socrates per se, still it belongs only accidentally to the one healed or cured. The proposition Socrates is a man is an per se one, because if Socrates were defined man, would be given in this defin his definition, as will be said below in Book 4. But the proposition what is healed or cured is man is an accidental one.